let's jump into the conversation. And I, I guess I'll just go ahead and acknowledge here at the top that this is uh, a kind of area or a set of topics that we have really struggled to do a good job with on this show before. And so this is some kind of tricky material, and I would really encourage everybody listening to not give us too much slack, like disagree with the things that you disagree with, but to listen with an open mind. I, uh, I honestly wouldn't be trusting this material to anybody other than Melissa after our conversations from that first interview. So I'll go ahead and I guess just jump into it by saying that I'm a materialist and an empiricist. I believe that nothing exists except for matter and its movements. I understand that the way that we view the world is all about the knowledge that we derive from an examination of the senses. So my goal tonight is in trying to understand what, if anything, Tantra and some of these other practices can actually offer to folks like me. I'm sure we'll get into this in a lot more detail, Melissa, but how do you respond to some of those ideas? Uh, I love that you're asking. Um, there is a rich history of uh, um, uh, mystical and sexual um, undertones to religious and spiritual belief systems um, throughout time. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it's fascinating. Uh, and that history informs us how cultures have thought about relationships, about um, uh, the way things work in the world. And obviously, they have been meaningful in some form or another, because they continue. They have a long line of tradition of continuing. And from my point of view as a sex therapist, um, the most that I have gotten out of my studies of um, probably a, human sexuality, religion, and um, magical practices related as well has been that mindfulness is really the key to um, tapping into our pleasure. And education is really the key to tapping into our pleasure. So that's what I think I get the most out of some of these ideas. Yeah, that notion of mindfulness and focus, I think, is going to be really central to everything we're talking about, more so or in place of some sort of mystical, magical, ineffable force. We're, we're talking about where we rest our attention and where our minds go and how that's going to naturally have an impact on our lives and our relationships and our connections. That said, it feels like a lot of these practices attract not only a particular worldview and personality type, but also often comes kind of bundled with a belief that like science or rationality or a desire to understand is somehow uh, hindering to the experience or somehow hindering to these practices. And I, I have to reject that out of hand. So I, I guess I'm wondering, is it possible to hold both of these things at the same time, to, to hold on to a desire for like connection and focus and what we might otherwise call magic while also looking to explore it and understand it through like a very rational worldview? Yeah, it's, it's not only possible, it's necessary. Sure. Um, Really, it's an art and a science. And I think we've seen the problems that come out of treating it um, as an art or a faith. Um, and uh, my, I think what has helped me the most is doing the research, understanding where some of these practices come from to the best of my ability. And um, it's definitely possible. And let me just speak a second on to the art part. Mm. Um, uh, I know that as um, an atheist, uh, an atheist can look at the world and say, look, science doesn't say um, that these things, you know, this ineffable idea or this mystical ideas really exist that we can prove. Um, I really think that the idea of science is founded on um, what we don't know. So we ask those questions and we try to get out of our own box to understand what's around us. So I think that the art is just as important as the science and you can't cut off one arm for the other. Yeah. 
Well, you know, so long as we are stirring the pot, I guess I want to explore the word spirituality because I, I know just that term in and of itself is kind of an eye roll trigger around the ACA and not without good reason. You know, you and I talked a little bit before the show and I really want to acknowledge my compassion for why some of this conversation and why some of these terms can make the hair stand up on the back of our necks. And particularly for people in the atheist community, people who oftentimes have really suffered at the hands of religion, there is a desire to really eschew anything that even looks or smells like magical thinking. So to that end, I've personally always seen the word spiritual as a valid way of describing ineffable experiences tied to our existential needs, things like our need for meaning, our need for connection, our inevitability of choice and the inevitability of death. How do any of these ideas or, or terms come into this discussion here tonight? Uh, actually, you said that better than I could. Um, that was a really fantastic way of saying it. Um, spirituality to me is um separate from religion where religion is organized around a specific belief system and um uh, people who are into those religions follow them uh based on the tenets the values and the beliefs now spirituality um is more uh diverse and stratified and all over the place so i, I it is more of what some people look at religion and go, ah, I can't do that, but I can come up with my own spirituality. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right. It's tied to our existential needs. Um, and I, I know that when we look at some of the practices out there, um, like Tantra, it, it, you know, especially when it's been kind of removed from its own, um, uh, belief system, uh, where it came from in the culture that it originated from, um, uh, it can look really scary and freaky. Uh, but I think that that doesn't mean that we need to invalidate them because there are things that we can get out of some of these practices. And I have brought together a bunch of practices in my life and my relationships and my practice as a therapist that I think help, um, clients expand their erotic ca canvas in a way that uh, might not have otherwise without these creative tools. Yeah. And, you know, we we may get into it later on, but I know that there are a number of places where I, in my own life, am willing to not... I guess it's not that I am walking away from rationality so much as perhaps giving myself permission to kind of play pretend a little bit. To And, and I do use the term play because I recognize that it is maybe disconnected from in like empirical objective truth, but it's also an opportunity for my mind to just explore an idea in a safe vessel and to, to experience a little bit of relief from that. Uh, one example I like to use is that when I close my eyes and I imagine myself breathing in the suffering of the world and breathing out some sort of healing, I don't actually believe that my breath is being transformed any more than I believe that the you know bread and wine are being transformed into the blood of Christ or anything silly like that. I don't think that my breath actually does anything to make the world a better place. However, by being willing to sort of play that game and imagine myself in that way, practicing what we would call Tonglen meditation, I do see myself becoming a little bit softer, a little bit more compassionate and contributing to a better world. And there's really great research, actually research coming out of UT Austin that evidences that, that evidences that people that study Tonglen can uh, meaningfully improve in their compassion and that people who are more compassionate are more likely to contribute to a better world in a number of different ways. So I, I think that that's a lot of what we're talking about, but still there are so many common misunderstandings and, and I feel like so many unnecessary barriers to people connecting with some of these ideas. Do you have a, a sense of what some of those barriers are or where some of these uh, barriers come from? Uh, let me think about that. I, 
I, I, you know, some of the more formalized religions and belief systems around spirituality are um, really compounded by a lot of um, moral values that don't fit my worldview. And um, that can, you know, I am not as uh, I have not studied Tantra. That's not something that I've done. And if I did, I would have to buy into the um, system of wanting to be Buddha, of mm -hmm. wanting to reach uh, Bodhisattva, right? Um, that's not that's not a system that I know well enough, that I've studied well enough, that I feel like I'm a part of. So does that mean that I can't um, experience some of the shifts in consciousness and perspective if I'm not in that system? No, it just means that I have to find what works for me and, um, uh, and work within that. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I actually think that's a important point. Not that we would just carelessly cherry pick from these different belief systems, but that also we can see all of these things as a as a form of rudimentary research. I mean, a lot of these ancient practices uh, continue to linger for a reason. And a lot of that reason can be bundled up into ridiculous geopolitics and can be bundled up into this very like convenient magical thinking and, and some of these other problematic things. That also doesn't mean that that so-called research hasn't discovered something of value from time to time. And I think that rather than reinventing the wheel in the uh, practice of psychology, that we can actually reap the benefits of some of that early quote unquote research. Uh, but in any case, I know that we will work to define things a, a little bit more concretely, but can you maybe describe some of the practices that we're discussing here? Uh, when we talk about magic or Tantra or, or some of these things, is it even fair to lump any of these things together? <laughs> I, I don't know if anything's fair. Um, <laughs> fair to uh, say. Yeah. Well, I, you know, um, yeah, and I don't know if I'm lumping them. I just know that for myself, I have taken a look and studied religion back to the you know early, early times, you know, and all the way up to try to understand where did we get some of these ideas that are going on in this world? Like, where do they even come from? What space and time and history did they come from? What was going on during those times that created these, um, uh, particularly with the uh, introduction of Christianity coming right after um, these orgiastic Bacchic rites were just kind of um, freaking out the town folk a little bit. And, you know, um, and the relationship that you see bes between Osiris and um, Christ and uh, there is the history is important to understand. Um, I've already forgotten your question. So now I'm, I've gotten <laughs> off on my own tangent. Yeah. Well, just to say, I mean, we are, we're covering so much ground here and I know, uh, for the last like 15 minutes, we've been sort of talking about what we're going to talk about. Uh, but I guess I just wanted to acknowledge that we are condensing thousands of years of human history and so many different cultures. And I think that we can maybe, uh, discuss sort of the, the meta tools or, or like how we do that uh, while acknowledging that it's not entirely fair, or maybe it is to, to lump some of these things together in these different ways. No, probably not. And, and the idea that, you know, uh, you and I kind of mentioned Tantra. Um, it, uh, it means many things to many different people. And because people kind of cherry pick what they want, um, and turn it into what they want. And because people have sexual needs and motivations, um, we do see a lot of weird stuff out there. And, yeah, you know, fair to say, I mean, it's kind of what makes humans cool is that we're kind of weird. <laughs> um, uh, I know that in my particular life, I took a path that led me to where I am now. And my path asked me to understand science and the art of um, uh, not the art of magical thinking, but creative thinking, getting outside mm. my own box. I oh, really like you, that, uh, that term, that distinction. Yeah. And if you don't mind, I wanted to speak to 
uh, the idea of energy. Mm, please. You know, because we were talking about last time afterwards um, that the idea of energy is really confusing and hard to understand. And how do we explain it? And I don't know how others explain it, but as a sex therapist, um, my understanding of energy is really our sympathetic nervous system, our, our whole system, all our cells. And, you know, we have a level of arousal all the time because we're alive, that arousal is there. So when we talk about, when I talk about energy, it's, it's really about um, how are we feeling in our bodies? How are we feeling towards others? How are we relating to ourselves? How are we relating towards others? So just like that, meditation you mentioned earlier on compassion that compassion meditation helps you to feel more softer and softer is kind of an energy that mm. is hard to explain but really it's just a feeling right when we're excited we feel an energy that's excited when we're mad we can feel that energy that feels mad so all the different um, belief systems that I've seen have different words for how to express some of these and different ideas on what gets in the way of really being present in the moment with ourselves, with our partners and the world around us. And um, there's lots of really neat ideas on how to become more present. No, I, I think that that was uh, such a valuable thing to address here. Uh, are there any other sort of preconceptions or, or uh, maybe misconceptions that are worth taking a look at before we, you know, really dive into the history of some of these practices? Uh, no, I mean, um, there's too many and it's too <laughs> fair to broad. say. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, there's lots of misconceptions, even for myself. I have a lot of misconceptions because these ideas, um, like one of the things I'm studying now is astrology. Because we can, not because I believe that it's this tool for divination, because but because it's a socio-cultural historical tool that's been used for thousands of years. And doesn't that fascinate you that, you know, we, we started off studying the stars and then it, the Greeks started adding in all the mythos to the stars. And next thing you know, we've got this system that is still being used today and still being hated today and is totally <laughs> misunderstood. But there's a lot of um, really great things that come out of um, looking at some of these things, if we give them a chance. Yeah, what people believe and why, rather than just dismissing the why, uh, being curious about it and willing to, uh, if not actually embrace these notions, to to look at what's underneath all of that. I, I definitely hear that, and I appreciate everybody uh, being willing to, I guess, jump on board with us uh, during this conversation.